NLP, close to natural language processing. The only reason, as I said last class, um, if IR is poor man's NLP, information extraction is uh, upper middle class to middle class NLP. Okay? In the sense they do not full NLP, but they do some reasonable amount of natural language processing to be able to extract facts from text. Okay? If, you know, so that's basically up to here. Okay? Um, the last thing is I will have the following question. Um, spouse of Rama X. Father of Rama X. Those are my questions. Tell me who is the spouse of Rama and tell me who is father of Rama. Once again, you know the answer. The machine has no clue. There is no spouse of and there is no father of. Now, I can say, well, what I should really be doing to be able to answer this query is, is to add more data here. For every uh, son of relation, I also have to write a father of relation which is the inverse of son of relation. And for, similarly, for every married relation, I also say, if you, you know, if Rama married Sita, then I have to write two things, spouse of Rama Sita, spouse of, spouse of Sita Rama. That's what your background knowledge is all about. Right? Okay, now if I write this, if I write all those pieces of facts here, and then Rama and Sita, God forbid, divorce, <laughs> right? <laughs> Then you have to go back and change all these additional spousal relations you wrote. Okay, this is the usual modularity question. Do you understand? Okay, so what you really want to do is write one background piece of information. Okay, what I want to write is son of XY implies parent of Y X. Okay, and that Father of XY, and parent and father of XY means parent of XY. And married XY means spouse of XY and spouse of Y X. This is background knowledge. You take it for granted. Your machine doesn't have it. You understand this because you know normal day-to-day -day life. You have background knowledge for that. If I were to tell you a story about some biological discovery, or in fact some you know, some facts about some biological discovery, there is background knowledge there too, and you know, biologists might see, you know, how to answer these queries. You don't, because they have the background knowledge, you don't. Okay, and you need a way of writing this too. You need some syntactic standard for writing these, and that is where RDF schema or OWL standards come in. So those are the background knowledge for the RDF triples. You see what I'm saying? Okay, and once you do this, in fact, the OWL and RD, just as RDF basically does a sort of an arbitrary limitation, but it's not a, such a big limitation. It says only binary predicates, okay? Uh, now, OWL and RDF schema might essentially, as you could say, for example, that they will support all of first order logic. They actually don't do that. Instead, they support a subset of first order logic called description logic, which is sort of class subclass relations. Okay, in fact, whatever I said here can be thought of in terms of class subclass relations. That means uh, the son of implies parent of. That means parent of set is a superset of son of set. Okay? And similarly, married XY implies spouse of XY. That basically means the spouse of XY set is a superset of married XY set. So set subsumption relations is what description logics are all about. And uh, OWL and RDL schema essentially provide a way to write these kinds of statements in some XML style format. Okay? And you know you need to know the standard for the writing that so that you can write it. And once you have this, essentially, you know, if you understand it from a logical point of view, there is this whole idea of theorem proving, where using these as well as the background knowledge, you can do theorem proving to ask whether or not uh, there is an answer to this question. That's just first order logical theorem. Okay. Obviously, theorem proving is harder than looking up. Okay, so in fact, if I don't have anything in the background knowledge, and I ask a query, you know, like this, uh, 
I can do this in terms of, this is also a logical knowledge base. If all my database is, all my data is in terms of base facts like this, then the inference is cheap. In the sense, the inference is essentially linear in the size of the database. Once you start throwing in, throwing in the background knowledge, even if the knowledge, the total size of the knowledge base is only this much, you can spend your lifetime reasoning with it. Because these are universally quantified sentences. These are really huge, huge conjunctions. For every x and y, such that somehow relation holds between x and y, the following also holds. You know, this is basically, from a knowledge representation point of view, we do have small brains. I understand most of us don't use what we have, but it's ultimately a small brain. And we live in a large world. Large world with humongous complexity. Right? How do we live? Why are we still here, you know, talking instead of being dead long back? Partly because we can we don't need a huge storage space to work with this really hard world. Because we have syntactically compact ways of representing very large universal statements. But then, once I do that, the compression held in the storage, but if you're talking about the complexity in terms of the input size, which is what normal database complexity is always in terms of, now the, the query complexity would be much higher now if you start allowing background. So semantic web, inference on semantic web is not going to be linear in the size of the data. But that's the price you pay for being able to do it this way. If you want it to be linear in the price of the size of the data, you throw these out, you expand this data. Write spouse Rama Sita, spouse Sita Rama, etc. And then it'll just be a lookup. Of course, then your database will be much larger and you'll be linear in this much larger database size. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So that's what semantic web standard of RDF schema is. So when we come back next class, uh, we will look at both RDF and RDF schema, the syntactic standards. Um, and uh, furthermore, for RDF, if you have uh, information written in RDF, there is a query language called SparkQL, uh, which basically essentially can handle queries. And we'll talk about how you know there are one of the interesting things about RDF data is now you have, before you had pages referring to each other, now you have data referring to each other. Entities are referring to each other in terms of the relational names. So the semantic web people keep reinventing names and now they also call themselves linked data initiative. Until now we have done linked pages, that's what HTML you know, hyper linked pages are all about. With the links now, Rama and Sita have a whole bunch of links. Rama and Dasharada have some links too. Okay, and how do you handle this linked data? You know, and what are the query you can do there? And we'll talk about that first, and then we'll talk a little bit about those standards. Too.